My name's Robert Jarvis. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Design at RMIT University in Melbourne. And uh, this is a video of me testing the sensing system that I used in the work that I'm going to be talking about today, Aileron 1. Aileron 1 is what I've been referring to as a spatial metacomposition. That is a piece of music that is arranged predominantly in three dimensions and is experienced by um, exploring that musical space. In Aileron 1, the method of exploration is sailplane flight. My background is in music performance and software development. It very often involves live audiovisual performance and it is often colourful and it is often experimental. The aim with the system built to create Aileron 1 is to colour space with music so that you create music as you move through a musical space. And the idea here is that patterns in motion, patterns in input data will result in patterns in music. And so we get musical representations of position over time or movement. So you can see we're not really talking about what we usually consider to be spatial music, i.e. there aren't any speaker arrays here. More accurately, we're trying to create a non-linear musical composition that is a function of a point in space, or spatial metacomposition for short. So the system for a spatial metacomposition might look something like this, where we're sensing position. This could be latitude, longitude, altitude, but also things like orientation, angular acceleration. Um, we are applying some sort of process to create a musical result. The sensing unit for Aileron 1 is relatively small, about the size of a deck of cards plus a battery pack, consisted of a Raspberry Pi computer and a Navio 2 flight controller board. It's able to be strapped to your body or attached to a hat. Um, in my case, to initially test the system, I put it in the back of my paragliding harness and captured some paragliding data. The sensing unit communicates directly to another computer which is tasked with interpreting the incoming data and then producing music. Um, log files can be taken off of the sensing unit as well and they can be replayed with a max patch which is also um, responsible for synchronizing associated video files. This allows for a very comfortable offline composition workflow that's similar to something like film scoring where you can scrub through previously recorded um, data and footage. From a composition perspective, I started by looking at two-dimensional distributions of key centers with an idea that you would be able to explore the harmonic progressions that exist distributed out on, for example, a piece of land. And I did this by using a hue to pitch mapping technique. The way this works is you take a cycle of fifths, map the notes of the cycle of fifths to their associated hues. The result of this is that um, distinctly different keys, for example, C and F sharp, are represented as 180 degrees out of phase or complementary colors. The visual effect of, is, of this is that smooth grad graduations in color mean consonance and contrasting colors suggest dissonance. I then extended this idea to be more generalized so that you were associating a particular musical 
um, element, in this case, a phrase of music, a few bars, a note, an arpeggio, something like that, with, an, with a particular hue. And then by using hue interpolation, you can smoothly distribute a range of colors in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional space, which means that as you move through that space, you're only ever going to be passing through neighboring hues, which means as a composer, you can create a group of musical ideas and in order to get from one musical idea to the other, you have to pass through all of the neighboring musical ideas. This means that it, you have some sort of constraint as a composer, but there's also an amount of predictability because you know in order to get from one phrase to another, um, the listener or the performer is going to need to pass through all of the intermediate phrases. And so this is a, a video of the prototype framework in action. And this is what I've now been starting to refer to as composing in space-time with rainbows, um, because you know it's a fun sentence, but also it quite accu accurately um, summarizes this process here we, where we are composing in both space and time and we're using hue as a fundamental property to um, arrange musical ideas. So in that sense, the prototype was a success. In another sense, it didn't sound particularly good, uh, we sort of showed that it worked, but we didn't have any particularly um, musically satisfying results. But it was at least enough to show that the idea worked. And from here, I was confident enough in the um, process to, to create some more mature tools that would actually allow um, compositional flexibility and allow a composer to create an actual piece of music. The next iteration of Tools was built as a set of Max for Live plugins and applied the concept of a hyperstave to Ableton's clip slot system. So clips are grouped together into hyperstaves and they are arranged by hue and hyperstaves are separated by empty clip slots. By switching back and forth between developing the Max for Live devices and composing small pieces of music, I was able to ratchet up in this sort of iterative software development composition process. And once the tools were mature enough to use effectively, I started working on a longer piece of music. So Aileron 1 is the output of that composition and development process. The piece Aileron 1 itself as a composition is structured vertically with layers of instrumentation increasing in density up to 950 meters above the ground. And this instrumentation runs along a repeating chord progression which also extends vertically into the sky. So since the composition as it exists in space is quite simple, it's interesting to see what musical results might emerge when you interact with that kind of space. The first thing that we come across in the case of glider flight is that um, a glider will tend to be towed into the air, it will be released, and then it will glide back down to the ground. And so, in the case of our composition, that means we run through the chord progression in one particular direction until we reach the top of the flight. We glide back down to the ground through the chord progression in the other direction. 
And so this highlights one of these the sort of key properties of these sort of musical spaces is that they are palindromic. If you write a chord progression, it needs to work in both directions. But this also leads to an interesting emergent point in the composition, which is at the point at which the glider releases from toe. Because as the glider is pulled up through the chord progression, there's quite a high rate of ascent. Because of that, there is quite a rapid progression of chords and a building of tension. And then at the point the glider releases from toe, it goes from rising quickly through the chord progression to flying essentially level. So you get this moment of harmonic suspension at the point at which the glider begins to glide. One of the approaches that I developed in the process of developing the software and writing little pieces of music was to lack a defined meter because that allows you to overlay different rhythmic elements that can act independently. So for example, in this case, the pizzicato violin is controlled by the overall velocity of the glider and that can operate independently of the rest of the piece. And also by lacking um, a defined meter, the harmonic content can move freely as well. Not everything worked. In the case of aerobatics, when the glider is moving vertically a lot faster than it would normally in regular flight, the chord progression moves too quickly. So the chords don't really establish themselves, they act almost more like a melody. It's musically interesting, but is perhaps not necessarily desired and for composers to have more control in the same way you might have levels of detail in a 3D model. We need to consider compositions at various scales so that they can take into account being performed at a variety of velocities. So just to explore um, some of the potential applications of these sort of systems, I want to compare it to existing work First, I think um, an interesting point of comparison is with Dolores Catherino, who ha has a microtonal um, music practice she describes as polychromatic music. And she actually conceives of hue as an additional spatial dimension in her, um, in her compositions. And so when I started colorizing pitch, it transferred to notation so easily um, that uh, it, it just allowed a great expansion in the number of pitches we could handle per octave. Hue is really good at representing things that are circular, and in music there are a lot of circular things. We're often working with loops. As frequency rises, there is a repeating cycle of octaves. Musical structure is defined in part by repetition. There are opportunities for applications of hue in the development of, for example, interfaces or creative approaches to composition, improvisation, that sort of thing. Another important point of reference is the work of Rolf Gelhar, who in 1985 created a work called Sound Equals Space which is perhaps the first example of what I'm describing as um, spatial metacomposition. There's a, a paper, Rolf Gelhar, Pioneer in Creative Music Technology, which outlines Gelhar's motivation in the creation of his works, notably 
His humanitarian commitment to the development of technological resources designed to widen participation in musical creation and performance. And I think there's sort of an opportunity with these sort of systems to turn anything into music, um, any kind of movement. And so, so there's a wide set of applications for um, various kinds of interaction that will meet people where they're at. To keep up with this work, check out zeal.co and zeal.tv on YouTube.